Well, hey there, guys. Greetings and salutations and welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet at the John Campus Show. Coming to you from right here for the last time in our quaint little studio brought to you in part today by our friends at Harry's and Miracle Made. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies and movie news, TV and streaming, all sorts of good stuff, not just giving you our opinions, but also hopefully giving you some information and context so you guys can form your own well-informed opinions, whether they're the same or even a little bit different than ours. Uh, joining me today, we've got writer, director, producer, Robert Meyer Burnett is here. Robert, how you doing? You know, it's always nice to be here. Beaming in, John, beaming in from a secret location. By the way, the Rob Observatory, you've been doing some work on the shelves there. It, it's all looking really good. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna, gonna to even look even better. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the, the I got the multicolored lights happening, but I, I will have diffusers on them. I just haven't put them there. Yet. Well, they look already really good as it is. And as do all of you guys, I can't see through the camera, but I'm sure you're all stunningly beautiful people. And we are so glad that you are here proving that you are also very intelligent and sharp people uh, for watching today's episode of The John Campus Show. We got a number of things we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, Quentin Tarantino has scrapped his movie that he's been working on for over a year, The Movie Critic. We got Transformers 1 drop their trailer. Uh, we've got Martin Scorsese doing a Frank Sinatra biopic. So we're going to go through those things. And then in the second part of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. If you got a live comment or question for the show, you can go ahead and use the Super Chat feature in the live chat. And as long as your comment or question is appropriate, uh, I'll address it in the second half of the show. And also later... Second half of the show, uh, we'll talk about the fact that we are moving and uh, we'll talk about where we're moving to and why we're moving and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get into that in the second part of the show. But for now, let's get into it, shall we? And we're going to start off with this. You know, I have always said, if you've watched me for any period of time, while there are definitely music biopics that I have enjoyed, absolutely. Uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, Walk the Line. You know, th there have definitely been musical biopics that I do enjoy. I have to admit that I've, I'm not really interested in musical biopics because I prefer biographies about people who like legitimately do things that change the world and kind of have different things. But if you bring up the idea of a biopic about Frank Sinatra, you could be getting into something kind of interesting there. We'll talk about why for a second, but right now it's being reported coming to us from the Hollywood reporter. Uh, that's the wrong story. Martin Scorsese is going to be doing a Frank Sinatra biopic with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. This is what IndieWire had to say. They said this, Martin Scorsese is taking on biopics of both Jesus and a music god, Frank Sinatra. We're going to focus on the Frank Sinatra one here now. The Oscar-winning Artur is rumored to be once more developing a biopic based on the legendary Croner, uh, a project Scorsese has been associated with before. He's I, We've been talking about Scorsese doing a Frank Sinatra biopic since my AMC day. So this has been, a, he's been just dating this for a long time uh, with longtime collaborator Leonardo DiCaprio in talks to play old blue eyes himself. Variety reported the news. DiCaprio recently starred in Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon and also led other Scorsese helm biopics like The Wolf of Wall Street and The Aviator. And on top of all that, Rob, they're talking about Jennifer Lawrence playing his wife uh, in it, which is just star studded. Now, like we said, Rob, before, this is a project that Scorsese has been talking about and developing and trying to get going. Right now, there's no studio attached. They're saying Sony is is the front runner right now to work with them uh, on making the movie. But I'll tell you why I'm interested in this if it's a Frank, why I'm interested in a musical biopic if it's a Frank Sinatra biopic. Frank Sinatra kind of shaped the world in his age, in his time. Sure. Like, he he was not just a musical icon. He was a cultural icon. He was a cultural linchpin, if you will. Like he had hands in so many facets of not just Las Vegas, but the American way of life. Not to mention everything that went down with the Rat Pack, his, his friendship with Sammy Davis Jr., all that kind of stuff. Like, you are now here for me, Rob, talking about a, you know, a, a musical figure 
that for me transcends just music, right? It, well, and it an isn't actor just too. another musical biopic that, you know, someone's a uh, a savant in music, comes from lowly beginnings, becomes a major superstar, falls to their own personal demons, and then by the end has something of a personal redemption, right? That's the, That's every musical biopic you've ever seen. I think this can be different. I think being done by a Martin Scorsese is fascinating. So uh, sign me up for this, Rob. We've heard people talk about this for years. What do you think about the fact that it sounds like there's now movement on Martin Scorsese doing a Frank Sinatra biopic? And is Frank Sinatra a worthy subject of a biopic? What do you think? First of all, I just want to say I saw Frank Sinatra live on the L.A. is my lady tour. No. Oh, yeah. This has got to be, what, 40 years ago? Wow. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I'm a, I mean, Frank Sinatra stars in one of my favorite movies of all time, which is The Manchurian Candidate. And this is a weird thing to mention, but Roderick Thorpe, who wrote the book, uh, was it No One? Was it, it the, the book that Die Hard is based on is actually a sequel to a book called The Detective. And Frank Sinatra played the main character in The Detective. Wow. So there's ties to Die Hard, but Frank Sinatra, dude, and of course, the character of Johnny Fontaine in The Godfather is based on Frank yep, Sinatra. Yeah, to totally based on Sinatra, yeah. So, so of course, he didn't like that, and of no, course, did Frank not. Sinatra was married to Mia Farrow when they made Rosemary's Baby, and I look, like you, I think Frank Sinatra shaped American history. I mean, he was he was a movie star. He was part of the Rat Pack when Vegas was new. He he was I, I mean, we don't have stars like him anymore that that could talk his way into any woman's bedroom, who could croon the great hits, who could be a star of stage and screen. I mean, this guy was this is back in the day when entertainers were gods. I mean, he's Mount Olympus level. And yet he had a very tumultuous personal life. So I think that um, I can't wait for this. I can't wait for this. And I'm actually curious to see DiCaprio do this. I, I You know, I, I have to say, I think he can pull it off. Well, I mean, yeah, I, th I think he absolutely can pull it off. I think he can do it justice. And here's one of the things that really fascinates me a lot, too, is also the social aspect. Because back in that era... Him having Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, yeah. As a part of his Rat Pack was not popular. It, a Jewish a black lot of, man? No. Yeah, not at all. And there are some great stories about like the Rat Pack showing up at a place for dinner and them saying, well, he can't come in talking to Sammy Davis Jr. And then mysteriously some very bad things happening to that establishment in the days that would follow. Uh, I mean, so there's, there's a lot of ground there that you can cover that I think would be really, really rich. And you, by the way, throw in there, somebody we haven't mentioned here, Academy Award winner, Jennifer Lawrence playing off of Leo DiCaprio, um, which, I mean, this could be really good. I mean, so. I'm excited, man. I, you know, I, I, I do. I mean, I think everything you've ever said about musical biopics is true. I, I think there's a trajectory to them and there's not a lot of diversity in them. I think when they do things like Rocket Man and uh, and Bohemian Rhapsody, when they're kind of more uh, esoteric, they can be more interesting. Right. But but I think because Frank Sinatra was such a colorful character in his life and he did so many different kinds of things. And really, I mean, he exemplified a certain part of, of America. Yeah, I mean, that, really that, that post-war beginning in the war post-war uh reconstruction and then the whole creation of the middle class and what he resent represented it's a fascinating period of american history and i can't think of look man if we're going to get the goodfellas casino martin scorsese or or the wolf of wall street and we get that kind of a movie with that kind of wit and verve dude i'm in i'm in i can't wait now of course uh, two of the big questions that'll come up with modern martin scorsese movies is he going to be asking for $200 million to make this movie again? Because that didn't work out so well for Killers of the Flower Moon. No, and I mean, yeah, I, I look, I think he's got to keep this. I mean, Wolf of Wall Street's almost three hours. Yeah. You know, Goodfellas is long. 
but there's that energy, you know, even that color of money energy, the way he shot a pool game in that yeah. movie. I think that's what he needs to do. And I got to tell you, I, I am sure he's wanted to make this movie his whole life because he's had characters like Frank Sinatra in his films before. And I just, man, I, I got to tell you, this is a tasty project. I hope he gets it financed. I hope he can make it well. All right, guys. Well, the question is for you. What do you think about this? It sounds like this very long gestating Frank Sinatra biopic being directed by Martin Scorsese is close to actually happening with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence. What do you guys think about it? Whatever you think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys. With that down, let's move on to this, shall we? One of the really exciting things that we saw at CinemaCon this year was a big presentation on the new animated Transformers 1. Now, I confess that, you know, I haven't exactly been excited about this animated project. So I was very curious to see what they're going to do. And they showed it to us. And I, I got to say, I liked what I saw. They showed us a trailer and then they showed us like a five, six, seven minute scene. And today they actually launched the trailer online. As has been reported, uh, they did finally put out the first Transformers 1 trailer and it's described about like this by The Verge. Set in the distant past on Cybertonian homeworld, Transformers 1 tells the story of how Orion Pax, who becomes Optimus Prime, voiced by Chris Hemsworth, and D-16, who becomes Megatron, voiced by Brian Tyree Henry, went from being best friends to mortal enemies soon after discovering their powers to turn into various kinds of vehicles. Now, the first thing I said at CinemaCon when I saw it was, this was not what I was expecting. And that's a good thing because yeah. I, I, what I was expecting them to try to do and whatever, I mean, because look, the reality is in recent years, and you can attribute a lot of this to Michael Bay, Optimus Prime had been turned into this dark, dour, sour, uh, grumpy, blah, blah, I'll kill you. Blah, 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 blah. Like he's, it's just there was there was no joy in Optimus Prime anymore. There was no mirth. Like like the 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 kind of character that we had in the original G one animated show that I grew up watching and worshipped so much. And this they went in a very very different direction. And it was jarring for me at first. But then I kind of started to catch the, the, the idea of what they were going for. And I got to admit, I got on board with it. Now, the trailer they showed us at CinemaCon is the same trailer they showed online. But I also had the benefit of seeing like a five, six, seven, eight minute long scene to go along with the trailer that gave that kind of filled in the gaps on what the trailer was there for. So basically, Optimus and Megatron are you know lower level denizens of cybertron but kind of like national treasure optimus discovers a map that is said to let through a secret signal he got that is said to lead to this mythical artifact known as the matrix of leadership which could change the destiny of cybertron and so they go on this quest to the surface of cybertron to try to find you know the matrix of leadership and all, all that kind of stuff and you know, the, the tone of it, Rob, the humor of it, you know, as soon as I saw the trailer CinemaCon, I thought this is not going to work for some <laughs> 40 plus year old guys who grew up watch like wanting something different. But I, I, I have to admit to you as somebody who's a very hardcore G1 Transformers fan, who's been very critical of the eighties Transformers animated movie and all that kind of stuff. This is different. But I think I like where they're going because it kind of works. And you and I haven't had a chance to talk about this yet. What did you think about the trailer? First of all, okay. You know, when I first saw Transformers, they were repacked the toys. They were repacked versions of other Japanese stuff from like Macross, Robotech, things like that. So I, I was like, I, I, I never, I, I've never had a real uh, love and affection because I was a little bit old and I loved Japanese shows like Gundam and, and Macross, Robotech, and things like that. So I always saw Transformers as a pretender to the throne. <laughs> but then I came to like them, and I've actually bought some in my my time. 
Uh, and I actually, when I saw Michael Bay's first movie, I really liked it. You know, the story of a of a boy in his car and wish fulfillment and some of the visual effects were just astonishing. And I really liked Peter Cullen came back. So I have developed an affection for this franchise. Watching this trailer, John, I was like, this looks pretty good. I mean, I love the fact that they're they're they've they're you're seeing this friendship that went awry. You, that's an irresistible story point. And going back this far, I think it's showing us something new. And I I'm excited. I was like, I I'll watch this. I mean, I went and saw Unicron in the theater. I went and saw the Transformers movie back. What was that? Eighty six when it was in the theater. Nineteen eighty six. Yeah, I went and saw it, and uh, I liked it. You know. And there's obvious certain connections to certain TV shows I'm fond of. But um, I thought this trailer, I, I put a smile on my face and I'm going. I'm going. Yeah, listen, I, and I don't know, honestly, how I would feel about the trailer on its own had I not seen the extended scene that went along with it that gave us a much better idea of the personalities and stuff like that. And by the way, Chris Hemsworth and uh, Brian Tyree Henry do a great job in it. I, you know, when Chris Hemsworth came out on stage at CinemaCon to talk about Transformers one, the very first thing, the very first thing after saying good morning to everybody that he talked about was working with Peter Cullen was, you know, the icon of Peter Cullen, the voice of Optimus Prime that I grew up with, that all of us grew up with, and talked about, you know, his conversations with Peter Cullen and and the the honor that it is to kind of pick up the shield for, for Peter yeah. Cullen and stuff like that. And, and what Peter Cullen and his approach was and what they thought the approach should be to this new iteration of Optimus Prime or Orion Pax at this point. And it, it really made me nostalgic at the same time, and I liked what I was hearing, and I think, look, this is going back to its roots. This is not a Transformers made for the 40-plus-year-old men like us yeah, who grew up watching G1 back in the 80s. This is for a new generation of people to hop on board with Transformers, and I, all I can tell you is that the stuff I saw looked pretty good. And I, I, I think there are going to be I, some people that have a predetermined idea, Rob, about what they want a new Transformers animated movie to be. And when they see that it's not what their preconceived idea is, they're instantly going to be against it. And I admit, I had some preconceived ideas about what I kind of thought, well, if this Transformers is going to be any good, it better do this. That was me. <laughs> and it's different than what I thought. But I, I see the potential in it. And so... Fingers crossed for me. Yeah, I mean, look, to me, here's the thing. It was apparent from the trailer that the people who made this put a lot of thought into it. Oh, yeah. And 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 my whole thing with IPs, as I've always said, is I want the people that are that are coming back with, to these venerable IPs, these things that have been around for a long time that people have literally grown up with. If they become the new custodians of these things, I want to know, whatever they are, that the people respect the IP. They've put a lot of time and effort into figuring out how this fits into the grand scheme of the IP. And it seems to me, and again, I don't know everything about Transformers, but it seems to me there was a lot of love and respect put into this. And you saw that by uh, Hemsworth, coming, Hemsworth coming out and saying immediately, hey, I had to talk to Peter Cullen. Oh, and by the way, you're talking about like this is clearly made by people who love Transformers. Yeah. Dude, just in the six, seven minutes that they showed us, there are some deep, deep <laughs> lore cuts. Okay, good. And just in little, little things like very deep cuts of true Transformers lore uh, that are in there. That's again, kind of um, highlights the fact that this is made by people. Now, listen, it's, it's made by people who clearly love Transformers. That doesn't mean it's going to work. The person who made that Dungeons and Dragons movie 20 years ago was the biggest Dun Dungeons and Dragons fan in the world, but that movie sucked. Just because right. somebody's a fan of the material doesn't mean it's going to be good. I agree. But it is definitely clearly made by people who are big fans of the material. So we'll see how that goes. Question is for you guys. What do you think? Did you have a chance to see the Transformers 1 trailer? If so, were you surprised like me? Like, it, it was not what I was expecting. But do you see potential in it? Maybe you see disaster in it. I think this is going to be a pretty damn uh, big hit 
for these guys. So hold on a second. I actually have to take this call. I feel bad. Hello. Yes, it is. Yes. And I, I have to jump off right now. I just want to answer your call to say, yep, I will expect you around one o'clock. Yes. Okay. No, 1240 is fine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that was sorry. Ryan Reynolds. Sorry about that. No, no. Um, sorry about that. We are we are moving today, and I knew that was the movers. <laughs> I want one set of the movers, so I had to answer the call. It was anyway. Ryan Come on. Anyway. Um, okay. So uh yes, whatever you guys think, jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that all down, let's move on to this, shall we? You know, Quentin Tarantino uh, has had a lot going on the last couple of years, at least almost has had a lot going on in the last couple of years. Uh, many of you guys will remember the world got shook when news came out that Quentin Tarantino was developing an R-rated Star Trek movie. And then that nothing came of that. And then we found out last year that Quentin Tarantino has decided and picked his final 10th movie which won't be his final movie, but he's saying it's going to be his final movie. It was called The Movie Critic. Well, even though this thing was supposed to start shooting in August, it ain't happening anymore. Uh, this comes just from the folks at The Hollywood Reporter saying, Quentin Tarantino no longer making The Movie Critic. Um, Quentin Tarantino is going back to the drawing board for his 10th and final film. The auteur had been preparing uh, to start shooting the movie critic this year, but is backing away from the project, sources tell The Hollywood Reporter. Tarantino had been honing the movie critic for months. Set in 1977, California, it initially drew inspiration from a cynical movie critic that the filmmaker grew up reading, but sources say it morphed along the way into a film that would also feature Brad Pitt as Cliff Cliff Booth, the stuntman he portrayed as an Oscar-winning performance in his Oscar-winning performance in Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It is unclear if this film was going to be a prequel or a sequel to the 1970 set uh, of Hollywood, but in recent weeks, Tarantino had a change of heart again and moved away from the film entirely. All right. So Quentin Tarantino has been working for like a year on this movie was going to be making this final one. He was going to draw an inspiration on not a literal biography, but, you know, based on the idea of this film critic he used to love reading when he was younger. Over the past year, the story has come to include Cliff Booth, which was Brad Pitt's character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, was going to play a prominent part in it as well. And, and Rob, they were going to start shooting this thing in August. I know. Like not a lot. They were going to do a little bit of shooting in August, a little bit of shooting in October and then go on hiatus and then start the full fledged thing early in 2025. But th we yeah. were just a couple of months away from them actually starting to shoot this thing. What on earth? First of all, were you looking forward to the movie critic and uh, what on earth do you think has caused Tarantino? Who's been sitting on this for so long to suddenly decide at this point in the game that he doesn't want to do in the movie anymore. What do you think? Well, I'm, you know, I, I've been a huge Tarantino fan since I was blown away. I didn't get to see Reservoir Dogs in the theater. And the first time I saw Reservoir Dogs, I bought it on Laserdisc because I'd heard it was good, you know, make a big splash at Sundance. And it was one of those movies where I put it on and I like watched it three times over the course of a weekend. I loved it so much. And the way it was shot, the way the, the, the characters were written, the actors, I, I'm like, this guy, and, you know, knowing it was an independent film, and, you know, no one knew who Quentin Tarantino was. And ever since then, he's never let me down. You know, all of his movies, even movies that aren't my favorite, like Death Proof, are still a, a lot of fun to watch. And his best movies, whether it's Inglorious Bastards, whether it's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, whether it's Django Unchained, I mean, all he's done is thoroughly entertain me. And I've always been impressed by how wildly different his films are. I think, John, I think he might have gone too far up his own ass with the <laughs> critic. I really do. I think that he wrote something that was so inside baseball to him. You know, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was very personal to him, yet it was a universal story that 
everybody could embrace because it was an evocation of the time in America and what Hollywood was like and these actors. I mean, it was such a great, but I think the movie critic might've been a little too inside baseball, even for Tarantino. Mm. This is, I know nothing about this. I'm just assuming and knowing a little bit about what the movie is about. I think maybe cooler heads prevailed. And he he probably thought to himself, do I want to go out on this? Like, let's just say this is his last movie. Like you, I don't believe it is, but let's say it is. Um, I think he wanted to make something that had more appeal. Like maybe this movie was a little too niche. It was important to him, but maybe he thought to himself, and maybe somebody told him, maybe his wife told him, I don't know, <laughs> that will 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 people actually dig this and understand what you're trying to do? Or is it too much? Is it too? I think he wants to make something, you know, a little grander that is more accessible to people. I think, think, but again, this is total speculation on my part. Do you think maybe a part of it too could be, because look, look, neither you or I believe that whatever his next film is going to be is going to be it. Like he's, he's too much of a creative genius that at some point, the itch is going to get him. Some idea is going to cross his head that he'll note he'll write down on a restaurant napkin someday. And then that idea will keep itching with him. And then he'll write a page say, well, what would a story like that look like? I don't know. What would it look like? And if he's just too much of a creative genius, he's not going to stop. But, but he's convinced that this, this next film is going to be his last. Do you think a part of it can then be a self-imposed pressure that, you know, oh. some like, if this is going to be my last one, it better be like the best thing I've ever done. And, and maybe he just looked at what he was putting together and thought, this isn't the best thing I've ever done. Go back to the drawing board. I mean, do you think that could be a part of it? I think that I think that could be a part of it. But I do think that I'll bet it was probably great. Mm. But I do think that he just thought that I might think this is great. But Quentin Tarantino's also very aware of the audience. And all of his movies are wildly fun to watch. He makes movies for his audience. And I think he might have finally come to a point where he he's like, is this what the audience wants? And like you said, he's got an enormous, he put that pressure on himself. But I think he probably said, maybe this isn't how the audience would want to see me go out. Now, I believe, here's the thing about him. I think that, remember, he's always said that all of his favorite directors, he's watched them in the waning years of their careers yeah. make movies he didn't think were worthy of them. And that's, that's his big fear. I think Quentin Tarantino, after watching once upon a time in Hollywood and the movies he, he made leading up to that, he's at the height of his creative powers. And I know he's got this imposed deadline on himself, but I think he's going to come to realize that he's got another great 10 years before he has to worry about going into decline. And maybe this is the catalyst. He'll be like, maybe this movie was my decline. Not that it was a bad film, but it would just, not be a film that would appeal maybe he'll make it for his 11th or 12th movie but i think he's going to come up with something that he's going to go out with a really big bang chances that he does kill bill three as his 10th film i don't think so yeah i would love him to but i don't think he will either i i because i think you know that's that's he's going to do something original and I think I don't see him ever making Kill Kill Bill one and two were conceived as one movie that they split up. Yeah. So so I don't think he would make a sequel if it is his last film as a as a as to go out on because his look his obviously his movies are a pastiche of other movies but they're all wildly original and I I can only see him going out with something equally as wildly original. Guys, question is for you. What do you think about this? This project that has had different iterations, the movie critic being focused on one thing, focused on another thing, morphed into different things. But apparently, even though it was supposed to start shooting in August, it's now dead. Quentin Tarantino does not have a 10th film lined up now. How do you feel about it? What would you like to see him do as his 10th so-called final film? But we all know it won't be his final film. Whatever you guys think, jump down to the comments section below and let us know your thoughts all right guys with that down uh we're gonna move on and start taking your live questions uh, as such we're gonna let rob take off now and get to some other business he's doing rob thanks so much for being here and we will see you again next week yes 
All right, John, I will be here next week with bells on. Uh, in the new studio. In the new studio. And it'll be good to have you with us. And uh, guys, we're going to get over to your live questions now. But before we do, we're going to take a quick second and thank a couple of sponsors of today's episode of the John Campus Show podcast. Our friends at Miracle Made and Harry's. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Miracle Made. Did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Made's bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. When they arrived at our house, my wife Anne loved the feel of them so much, she couldn't even wait for me to get home to put them on our bed. Miracle Made has self cleaning. These sheets are infused with silver that prevent prevents up to 99.7 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresh three times longer than other sheets. Miracle sheets also have incredible comfort and quality. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. So go to TryMiracle, that's T-R-Y-M-I-R-A-C-L-E dot com slash Campia to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one. If you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code CAMPIA at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA and use the code CAMPIA to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash CAMPIA Campia to treat yourself. Guys, we want to take a second to thank a sponsor of today's video, Harry's. You know, guys, in order to start the John Campia show, I had to leave my high paying corporate job in order to set myself up to be happier and enjoy more personal success. Because sometimes to get what you want, you have to challenge the status quo and blaze your own trail. And that's exactly what the folks at Harry's did. You see, at Harry's, they saw customers getting ripped off by questionable products in the shaving industry and decided to do something better. Harry's decided to pave their own road by making beautifully designed razors for a fraction of the price of the other big brands, except Exceptional products, honest prices. That's Harry's. I have fallen in love with Harry's from their foaming shaving gel that feels just luxurious on the skin to their incredible razor that feels just as good in the hand as it does going over your skin. They've got rich lathering skin softening body wash and scents like redwood, wildlands, and stone. You see, Harry's provides German engineered blades made in their own factory that stay sharp longer. You can get a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover for just three bucks at harrys.com slash campia. Don't settle for the status quo. Blaze your own trail with Harry's. Get started with a $13 trial set for just $3 at harrys.com slash campia. That's harrys.com slash campia for a $3 trial set. And thank you to our friends at Miracle Made and Harry's for sponsoring today's episode of the John Campia Show podcast. All right, guys, we're going to go over and take your questions um, here now. But before we do, um, I, I thought I'd give you guys the lowdown on the fact that today is the last day uh, that we're going to be doing the show from this studio, the studio that we have now been in for two years. And uh, first of all, the question that I see some people asking is, where are we moving to? We are moving back to my house, going back to my garage studio. So the second question after that is, well, why are we making this move? Mm. So I'm going to give you, I already explained this to our beloved YouTube channel members about a month and a half ago, but I'll let you guys know here now. This is what's behind us deciding to make the move. You know, when I left uh, AMC slash Collider Movie Talk and I was starting my own channel, one of the things that I always said was, was that I was not going to allow myself to fall into the trap of trying to make AMC movie talk 2.0. You know, I, I wanted to make it uh, a, a more personal thing. I wanted to make it a more intimate thing and all that kind of stuff. The problem was <laughs> problem was that we grew a lot more than I thought we would. And the channel got bigger than, than I thought it would be. And so my mindset is, okay, well then expand and grow. So we started adding one or two people. Then we started to want to do a couple of extra shows and we just outgrew my garage. And 
the studio that we had set up in there, even though it was a really nice little studio we had in my garage. Anyway, so we found this fantastic office space and we continued to grow. So we did a daily John Campy show and we had four other weekly shows plus open mics. I added about four or five more staff. Like at one point I had like eight staff, half of them were full-time, half of them were part-time, all this kind of stuff. And we were expanding and expanding and expanding. And I just suddenly realized at one point a little over a year ago that I'm doing exactly what I said I wouldn't do. I'm trying to create AMC 2.0. And that's not what I want. And I was working like 14, 15 hours a day, which was untenable. And I started realizing too, all these extra shows we were doing were costing us more to make the shows than they were actually generating revenue. So like, I, I'm just throwing some numbers out there just as an example. Like it would cost us $600 to make an episode of Heroes, but Heroes was only making us about $300 in revenue per episode. <laughs> so I realized we were doing all this extra work, having all this expansion and all this staff and it's not what I wanted it to be. I was running myself into the ground. We were making shows that were costing more than they were even making or worth. And so I made the decision, you guys will remember last year, that we were going to cut back a lot. And, you know, part of that was then uh, letting some staff go. We cut a bunch of people who were full-time down to part-time because we no longer had other shows to do. And, you know, and that's why Rob left for a while, because at the time when I was moving Rob from full-time to part-time, part-time didn't work for him in his schedule at that time. So he was gone. We always told everybody he would be back at some point, but it just didn't work for him at that time. And, and, you know, he's got, he's finished some projects. His schedule's now changed. So he is available to be on, on a part-time basis, which is great. Um, now, once we cut out all those extra shows and I didn't have nine staff anymore, we just started to realize, even though we love this office space, we realized about a year ago, we don't need 2,000 square feet. We literally have three full rooms that we haven't even walked in in the last nine months because it's just really me, Jonathan, Ray, and, you know, one day a week or a couple days a week, Chris would be in. A couple days a week, Rob would be in. That was it. And we just realized we don't need this space anymore. We don't need it. It's way too much than, than what we require. And so about four or five months ago, we made the decision that we were going to finish out our lease and then move out. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. Now, a really good logical question to ask would be, well, John, you know, do you regret that you moved into this studio and all that kind of stuff? No, I don't regret it. It was a great experience. I mean, in 2022, like our first full year in this space, we as a tiny little butt fuck nobody YouTube channel, we generated a million dollars in revenue. Uh, I didn't personally make a million dollars, but the company generated a million dollars in revenue that the channel did. Um, and that's more than AMC ever made. Uh, when I was doing stuff at AMC, that's more than Collider uh, video ever made when I was there. Even though AMC and Collider both had business people that always said, we're going to be able to, you know, get all these sponsorships and they were never able to do it. I was very lucky that I found a great guy to, to shepherd our sponsorships and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was great. I mean, it was absolutely fabulous. It was a wonderful experience that we've had, but I, I decided over a year ago, I want to make it again more about what I want it to be. And so you guys have seen for the past year, it's really been the John Campia show with some open mics. And that's exactly what I want it to be. I don't want it to be bigger. I don't want it to be grander. I don't want to create a media empire. I don't want to do any of that kind of stuff. This is exactly what I want it to be. And as such, we're going to move into a space that accommodates that a lot better, uh, which is, again, our garage studio, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, so, and right now, Jonathan and Ray are on the other side of that door, packing boxes and all that kind of stuff 
as the move begins today, uh, there's not going to be a John Campus show tomorrow because we're going to be moving. And then we're going to finish the move on the weekend. And then on Monday, the John Campus show starts back up again in the new old studio. So that's what's happening. I'm very excited about it. And uh, yeah, so that's where we're at. So now with that uh, ram rambling all out of the way, uh, we're going to go back to your questions that you guys have been firing. And so let's jump over right now and see what we got. Who are we starting with? They're starting with Johnny Got Lost. And Johnny Got Lost writes, I know you probably haven't heard of the show Wayne. No, I haven't heard of it. Because it was a YouTube original, but this show is great. Hilarious, heartfelt, and raunchy. Uh, made by Deadpool 1 creators. It gets stellar reviews and is available on Amazon. Crossing my fingers for season two. I'll, I'll be honest with you. You're absolutely right, Johnny Got Lost. I've never even heard of it. Have any of you guys in the live chat heard of this show, Wayne? I, that I guess started as a YouTube original. Remember, Cobra Kai started as a YouTube original as well. Um, that as well. But yeah, so Haunted on him saying, nope, never heard of it. Yeah, a lot of people. So thank you for putting it on people's radars, Johnny Got Lost. All right, next up, we got Gray Fox who just sends in a Super Chat badge to be supportive. Thank you, Gray Fox. Uh, Tyler Knox Floyd writes, Hey John, quick question. If Beyond the Spider-Verse lives up to the first Spider-Verse movies, or is even better uh, than Into and Across, will it be the best animated trilogy? I've been asked that five, six, seven, eight times. Because Into the Spider-Verse was mind-blowingly fantastic. Across the Spider-Verse might be even better. If Beyond the Spider-Verse comes out, and this is a big if, because who knows, it could be, it could suck, it could be awful, it could drop the ball, who knows. But if, a lot of people ask, the third film is on par with the other two, is it then the greatest animated trilogy? I'm going to say it is the, it would be, it would be the second greatest animated trilogy. I don't think you can surpass the Toy Story trilogy. I mean, Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. And by the way, I think 4 is fantastic as well. It's the least good of all the Toy Story films, but I still really liked 4. But the first three Toy Story movies, I, I mean, it doesn't matter how good Beyond the Spider-Verse is, I don't think it takes the crown away from Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. Um, but, I mean, who knows? ask again once the third one comes out, but I'm pretty sure Toy Story's reign on the throne is uh, is, is pretty safe is pretty safe. All right. Next up, uh, we go to, that was, uh, okay. So we did Johnny got lost part two, uh, toasted shoes writes, Hey, John and crew I was looking forward to watching the ministry of ungentlemanly warfare, but found out it's not getting an international release. Any reason why a studio would do this? It's not normal, but it does happen from time to time that, um, Maybe they just couldn't get a good deal for international distribution. Maybe they don't think the movie itself would work as well in other markets. I mean, because remember, distributing a film is a very expensive undertaking as well. And maybe they just feel it'll work well in theaters in North America, but won't necessarily distribute as well overseas. I mean, again, there can be a million different reasons and it is unusual, but it's not completely unheard of. It does happen from time to time, but I'm looking forward to seeing it tonight. I'm going to go see it tonight. I'm really excited for it. All right. Next up, uh, we've got, uh, Matan Valinsky writes, a24 betrayed the arts with those civil war AI posters. No, they did not. Uh, screw Alfred 24 for letting this happen late night, uh, of, with the devil was the beginning of a slippery slope, uh, bolt tree or whatever that is. So for those of you who don't know what Matan is talking about, there's a little bit of a controversy out there right now where a 24, um, has put out some posters. All right. They've put out some posters and they, Apparently, they use some AI technology like in Photoshop or whatever to create these posters. I have no problem with that whatsoever. We're not, we're not talking about movie makers. We're talking about marketing. Um, some people in marketing leverage some AI tools to make some posters. If anything, the problem I have with 
the the posters they put out is that they're scenes that aren't actually in the movie, right? So these shots that they put in these posters showing like a post-Civil War America, what it would look like. So it's a lot of, you know, destruction and it's a lot of fire and smoke and whatever. Um, the problem I have with it is that there's there are posters of shots that aren't in the movie. That to me is a problem, but the fact that they used AI tools to make the the posters, I have no problem with it. I, I really don't. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, listen, AI is as far as art generation and stuff like that, it's just another tool. You know, like did do artists get mad when, you know, 15 years ago, people making posters started using Photoshop instead of just all pure hand drawn or photo? I, it's the advancement of technology. Now, I do believe there needs to be some guardrails and some lines you should not cross when it comes to using AI in actual filmmaking. But honestly, for me, I'm using it in marketing, I, I don't see a problem with it. I'm not saying I would do it. But I really don't think it's a big deal. It's 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 new technology. It's new tools that are available to them. And they're going to try using these tools and see what they get. I honestly don't have a problem with it. I have a bigger problem with the fact that they're creating posters, imagining shots that aren't actually in the movie. So anyway. All right. Next up, uh, we go to Cody Hunt, who writes, uh, watched interview with Cosmo Jarvis and he doesn't sound like Blackthorn at all. So that drunk Tom Hardy voice is intentional. What a choice. Yeah, I've never heard him interviewed. So just for those of you who don't know, uh, Cosmo and the character he plays, John Blackthorn, that's the main character or one of the two main characters on the greatest show in the world right now, Shogun. And if you're not watching Shogun, you're only robbing yourself. It's the greatest thing on TV. It's incredible. Uh, and Cosmo Jarvis is fantastic in it. I I just imagine that that's, that's what his voice would actually sound like. Uh, but whatever, maybe it doesn't. I got to go look up these uh, interviews to hear for it, hear for myself, Cody. All right, next up. Isaac Martinez writes, I won't be surprised if the movie critic becomes a book in the near future. I completely agree with you. Uh, well, I hope Tarantino writes uh, a good script to end his 10 movie career. And again, I don't believe for a second that his, he's going to be over after he's going to be done after his next one, but he has been getting into writing novelizations, right? He did that for once upon a time in Hollywood. And I think you're right. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Isaac, if at some point Tarantino just, fleshes it out and makes the movie critic into a novel that he puts out. I'm not saying he will. I'm not saying I've heard he is. I just think there's a pretty good chance that that happens. All right. Al writes, has there been a time you fell asleep in a theater? No, not because I've never seen a boring movie. I have never fallen asleep in a theater because I'm one of these guys that I have a very hard time falling asleep period. Like if I go to bed at 10, which hardly ever happens, let's be more realistic. If I go to bed at 11, I'll be lucky if I'm asleep by 1145. My wife, Anne, and her brother, Ray, have this mutant power that if they decide they want to fall asleep, they close their eyes and five seconds later, they're asleep. But I am not one of those people. I have a very, very difficult time all the time falling asleep. It's it's actually a challenge for me. I actually take a, like a sleeping aid now to try to make sure I get to sleep. Because there, there before I started taking sleeping aids a couple of years ago, I would there would literally be two or three nights a week that I would go to bed at like eleven thirty and still be laying there awake at two thirty in the morning, and I got to get up at six, right? And so no, because of that, I have never fallen asleep in a movie theater. All right. Next up, Cody Hunt writes, uh, Ronan Farrow for Frank Sinatra. I, I mean, despite the, the background connections there, I don't know that that would be the best idea, Cody. Cody also writes, after Abigail, seeing Abigail tonight, pretty excited, Cavill tomorrow. I'm going to try to pull off a double feature tonight because I'm really looking forward to both of these. I thought the first trailer for Abigail about the little girl vampire Mm, banger. I thought that was great. Obviously, I'm a huge Henry Cavill guy. Got Alan Richson in there, Isaac Gonzalez, Alex Pettifer. Uh, I mean, I'm just so excited for the uh, Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare, too. So I'm going to try to pull off a double feature tonight after we're done a little bit of moving. All right. Next up, we got Chris Miner. Uh, and Chris Miner writes, 
Uh, going to watch all 18 Fox Marvel movies to build up for Deadpool 3. Uh, what is the best and worst from that studio? For me, the best is X-Men Days of Future Past. And my worst from what I've seen is the Fantastic Four. Yet to see Elektra. Yeah, Elektra was not good. Elektra wasn't good. It wasn't the worst, but it, it wasn't good. You know, for a long time, I would have said that the best Fox era stuff with the X-Men stuff was was X-Men 2. I mean, look, that that's still one of the greatest comic book movies ever made. Um, but then came along Days of Future Past. Days of Future Past is a masterful comic book movie. I, I, I watched it again just a couple of weeks ago, and I'm like floored by how, that, how good that movie is. And, and I think, yeah, but then you've got the Deadpool films, right? So they're incredible too. As far as the worst one goes, Age of Apo X Men Apocalypse is is pretty bad. Um, X Men Origins Wolverine, pretty bad. X Men Three wasn't great, but it also wasn't terrible. I, I it it was not good, but it wasn't like really really awful either. Uh, but yeah, those are just some of the ones that I would list in there. All right, thanks a lot for that, Chris, and good luck with your marathon, man. All right, next up, Amin writes. Uh, did you know Trap was filmed at the Rogers Center? Oh, in Toronto? I did not know that. Trap is the new uh, M. Night Shyamalan movie. They just dropped the trailer for it today. We saw a big presentation for it at CinemaCon. It actually looks really good. I'm excited to see it. Uh, but I didn't know they shot it in Toronto. That's great. All right, next up. CM Waters writes, Transformer 1s look like it'll be a solid Paramount Plus exclusive. Hey, wait a minute. Hey, listen, you know what? I think it's going to be good. And I think it's going to make a lot of money. By a lot of money, I don't mean $600 million. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. But I think this movie's... And again, I think it's it's not targeted to the 40-year-old plus men who grew up watching it in the 80s. It's, it's not targeted at us. It clearly is not. But... I'm open-minded enough that even though I have some very definitive ideas about what I want a Transformers to be, I'm open-minded enough that I looked at what they did and said, you know what? Put my expectations out. This looks like it could, could, could be pretty good. There's some real upside here, especially when they showed us the full extended scene, which you guys haven't seen yet. But um, I I'm thinking this movie can make, uh, I think this movie is going to make some money. I really do. Anyway. Uh, all right. Next up. We've got Eddie Burton, who writes, one of two. Jack Nicholson is one of the few movie stars that didn't make himself too accessible. That's true. Uh, adding to his aura and made him a bigger star. The only way to see him was either at the movies or at a Lakers game. My question is, do you think Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Cruise are the last of that kind of star uh, that make themselves more uh, valuable and bigger of a star because they don't make themselves too accessible? Um, there is an argument to be made for that because you're right. Like Jack was always an enigma in many ways, like only ever seeing him in the movies or seeing him at, 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 you know, courtside at the Laker games. But it also didn't hurt that he had a legendary acting career with some phenomenal movies and Oscar attention and all, I mean, all that played into it, right? It's not like he was some mid range actor that decided to remain, like, stay in the shadows, and suddenly he's a big star, right? Like, he is a significant major movie star, right? So I don't know if there's a cause and effect. It's certainly added to the aura. Leonardo DiCaprio, the same thing. I mean, remember, Leonardo DiCaprio, when he got started, he was the young teenage heartthrob in every single teeny bopper magazine and all that kind of stuff, and that gave him a meteoric rise. Like before Titanic ever happened, Leonardo DiCaprio was a big star. Like a huge, huge star. Um, So I don't know. I think it definitely adds to the aura of who they are. But then again, who are the, like, you look at Dwayne The Rock Johnson, massively publicly available. Uh, the two highest paid actors in the world right now are Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Ryan Reynolds, massively active 
on social media and make themselves very available and all that kind of stuff. So again, I don't know if, if there's a causality there. I don't know if there's a causality there, but it definitely adds to the aura of a, of a performer. All right. Good question, Eddie. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Matan who writes, Tarantino needs to stop being a wuss about 10 films and just go full uh, Heiho Miyazaki with his retirement plans. It'll be so funny. Listen, I absolutely guarantee you, it doesn't matter if it's Jay-Z, it doesn't matter if it's Miyazaki. You, look, you get creative geniuses. They can very well want to stop and they can think they are stopping. But when you are a creative force of nature, like Quentin Tarantino is. You can't fight your nature, baby. It's just too much a part of his DNA. It is his nature. He's going to have another story, because he's so brilliant, he's going to have another story idea that's going to itch in his brain in a year or two, and it's going to keep itching and itching and itching, and finally he's going to put something down on paper, and it's going to itch some more, and then eventually you're going to hear, yeah, 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 I'm going to make an 11th film. It's, it's going to happen, 100% guarantee it. 100% guarantee it. All right. Next up, Ian McAllister writes, uh, I'm with uh, you, Ray. King Arthur is my favorite Guy Ritchie movie too. I hope we see Charlie Hunnam in more roles like King Arthur and The Gentleman. Listen, I everybody hated King Arthur. And I really quite liked it. I do not think it is Guy Ritchie's best film. But I really quite, I had a lot of fun. It's a true Guy Ritchie movie, that King Arthur movie. And I don't care what anybody else says. I had a blast with it. And yeah, seeing Charlie Hunnam work with him a couple of times, both in The Gentleman, which I loved The Gentleman with Charlie Hunnam, Matthew McConaughey, Henry Golding. That movie was awesome. And it led to the Netflix series, which is also really good. Uh, my favorite Guy Ritchie film is still Snatch. That, that, that's, Snatch is still a top 20 all-time favorite best film of mine. Like I, I, it's in my top 20 all time favorite films. So that one is my favorite one, but guy Ritchie's so good, man. I mean, then even does an Aladdin remake. I thought when they chose him to direct the Aladdin remake, I thought that was a really weird choice and look what he did. Film made a billion dollars. It was fantastic. Anyway. Yeah. Guy Ritchie, guy Ritchie, ladies and gentlemen for the win. All right. Ian McAllister also writes, did you guys see twisted metal? It's really good. I no, with Anthony Mackie and Samoa Joe. I heard a lot of people say it was pretty good, but I never got around to watching it. I, I think I will at some point, though, Ian. All right, next up. Wesley Cunningham writes, Trap looks like an, an inverse of Shyamalan's stick. A twist revealing setting off the premise instead of at the ending. Didn't dig old, but hope this hits. Yeah, listen, M. Night... I mean, you, you're going to write books about M. Night's career, about this meteoric rise, maybe a little bit premature of meteoric rise, and then a monumental crumbling of his career. And in the last couple of years, he's made some decent little films, starting with The Visit that had Katherine Hahn in it. That was a really nice little film. That was the first one that he did in his kind of comeback that I thought, you know, that's all right. That's not bad. And then he did Split, and a lot of people really like Split. And then he did Glass. I didn't like Glass, but whatever. Okay, that's one out of the past three. And then even old wasn't all that bad. I mean, I think old had some real things going for it. I, I didn't love the film, but it definitely had some things going for it. Basically for me, M. Night has recreated himself into a filmmaker I'm interested in again. And I couldn't be happier for the guy. The old sham hammer is back, baby. And, and I hope this movie, I think this movie looks really good. I, I think uh, Trap looks really good and I'm looking forward to seeing it. All right. Uh, next up, that was Wesley. So now we've got Ian McAllister who writes, The Spiderwick Chronicles drops tomorrow on Roku. Will you end up watching it? It's getting great reviews. I'll be honest with you. I'm not really interested in it. I, I mean, I'm still trying to get finished up on um, um, uh, Fallout. I'm still trying. I'm, I'm five episodes into Fallout. I, I'm really enjoying Fallout. I got to finish that off. At some point, I got to watch Invis Invincible Season 2, waiting on the finale of Shogun. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not the target audience for spider Rick Chronicles. It might be good. And maybe if I hear enough people tell me it's excellent, maybe I'll jump on it. But right now I don't personally have plans to watch it, but that's just me. Not, I no hate towards it at all. It's just that I don't have plans to watch it right now. All right. Jared Oberfeld writes, 
Uh, buy or sell? The Coyotes should have moved to Quebec City. I say buy. Also, I am uh, totally digging the Transformers uh, 1 trailer. Yeah, I, I... Then again, listen. Let me emphasize this again. I really like the Transformers 1 trailer. But I think a lot of that has to do because I saw the extended scene as well. That extra seven minutes. And that helps color in for me, fill in the gaps of the trailer. Like I'm able to see the trailer through the lens of having a better idea of the tone and the feel of the movie than just the trailer gives on its own. And I wonder how I would feel about the trailer if I didn't see that those extra seven or eight minutes. And I don't know, but I did see the other seven or eight minutes and it made me appreciate the trailer even more. So I do like it. Um, listen about whether they should have moved to Quebec city or move. It, it's all about finances. It's business. Uh, can Quebec city maintain a team? Can they, can they have enough positive revenue upside versus moving to Utah? I don't know. I think Utah. look, there's not a ton of us markets. That I think the NHL can thrive in. I think Utah is one of those markets. Quebec had its chance. They had the Nordique for a long time. And uh, I, I think they'll get a chance again sometime, but I'm okay with the move they made right now. All right. Uh, next up, uh, South Texas Shark Rights. After the show, a lot of people are playing Fallout. I mean, yeah, I, absolutely. I think a lot of people jumped on board with Last of Us 2 after Last of Us came out. It's, it's a natural, natural progression. All right. Moda Awesome writes, the Accountant was my Dune 2 for me. Nice. Uh, by Dune 2, I mean my favorite movie of the past decade is Dune 2 is for you. Uh, one of the smartest written and executed films I've seen should have gotten Oscar attention. I Listen, I, I'm not going to talk about whether or not it should have gotten Oscar attention, but that is a criminally underrecognized movie. Ben Affleck's The Accountant, I, I thoroughly enjoyed and I was so bummed out that it did so badly at the box office and was so bummed out when it never got a sequel. They are making the sequel now, and I'm super thrilled about that. But while I may or may not agree that it should have gotten Oscar attention, I completely agree that it is a criminally underrecognized movie. I, I thought it was wonderful, and I'm super happy for it that they're, it's finally getting a sequel because I will be there to see it, no doubt. All right, Logan Vaughn writes, Let's say Taylor Swift is in Deadpool 3. There's a pretty good chance of that. Uh, will they use her in advertising to increase ticket sales or make it a secret cameo appearance? Okay, listen to me. If Taylor Swift is in Deadpool 3, and I think there's a decent chance that, that, that she will be. Not, not a lock, but a decent chance. Unless it is just a quick cameo, if it's a quick cameo, they probably won't put it in the advertising. But if it's more than just a quick cameo, like even if it's a small role, there is no way Disney won't put her in the trailers. Of course they will. I mean, they won't make it look like it's her movie, but you absolutely put at least a shot of her in the trailer. It's marketing. You have the biggest superstar in the world right now in your movie. You at least show a shot of her. Now, look, they did that for Cats. It didn't save Cats. They did that for um, Amsterdam. Was that the one she was in? I think it was called Amsterdam. It didn't really help that. But in a movie like Deadpool, 100%. But again, that relies on a lot of ifs. If she's in the movie. And even if she's in the movie, if she's more than just a cameo. So... We'll see. But yeah, if she's got any kind of a role in the film, we, yeah, they'll put her in the trailers for sure. All right. Seconds from Disaster Rights. Mafia boss Michael uh, Franzesi said Sinatra has asked them for favors to handle certain people that were causing problems. Do you think this uh, his ties will be addressed at all? It is Scorsese after all, 100%. It is part, that is an aspect, because I'm no Frank Sinatra worshiper. But it is one of the aspects, it's one of the dimensions of Frank Sinatra that I think could make for a very interesting biopic. Unlike a lot of other potential musical biopics, which are all the same. A young savant discovers it for coming from lowly beginnings, discovers incredible talent, 
gets discovered, becomes a huge mega star, then their own personal demons lead to their downfall, and then they have some kind of personal redemption at the end. I just described Rocket Man. I just described Bohemian Rhapsody. I just described Walk the Lion. I just described almost every musical biopic. This is one of those things, and there are several. This is one of those things that makes a Frank Sinatra biopic possibly very different. So I hope they do. I do hope they go into that part of his of his life and his character, if you will. All right. Next up, and our final question of the day comes to us from uh, Dante Siraccia, who writes, Hey crew, I just finished first two of three Wild Robot books. I didn't know there were books. Uh, Y'all aren't ready for this film. It's going to be a huge hit for Universal. Bring on the filthy. I'll tell you what, when they dropped that first trailer for the Wild Robot, I saw the Wild Robot. Oh, a robot living in the forest. Who cares? And then I watched the trailer. And it's like, I'm not crying, you're crying. As he finds the egg, hatches the egg. Helps the little goose speak, you know, learn to walk, and then it's flying away in a migration. Come on, tell me you didn't get a little choked up at that. Come on. Of course you did. It's emotional. It's beautiful. Um, I can't wait to watch it. Then they showed us this big presentation for it at, uh, at CinemaCon. Uh, it, it was just uh, Lupita Nyong'o came out and, and gave this big speech about it and did the present presented this long piece of footage from it. It it looks so good. So I went from being zero interest in it to being extremely interested in it. And I, I think it really does look all kinds of great and I'm excited to see it. And all right, guys, that'll do it. For today's installment of the John Campia Show podcast, thank you so much for being here and making this little show part of your day. Big special thank you to all of you guys who sent in your, those super chats. Number one, because you gave us fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the show, thank you guys so very much for your support. Again, don't forget, there's not going to be a John Campia Show tomorrow. We're taking the day off to just move, pack and move and get the new studio set up as we'll be doing all weekend. But Monday, the John Campus Show returns and uh, we're looking forward to having you guys back with us. Big thanks to uh, Jonathan and Ray for helping me get today's shows together. Big thanks to Robert Meyer Burnett for being on and uh, we will see you guys again next week and until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs>